Can you hear over the fan? Okay. What about the TV? Is it hurting? It? No? Good enough. So, well, welcome. This is one of our regular meetings. Uh, this year we kind of did every other month, even though there's always something going on every month. So we did this, and um, at this time I would like to, I brought the flag in awkwardly. Thank you, Senator, for your help. And we've got that in. Um, Stan, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Father, we just continue to pray for our country. Father, we pray for our military, for those serving on foreign soils. Father, we just pray for their safety. We pray for their families. We just pray, God, you'll touch them in a very special way. Father, our leaders in Washington and our leaders in each of the 55, each of the 50 states uh, need your divine guidance and, and, lead, and your direction in their lives. Father, we just pray that you will just anoint them in a very special way as they continue to do the work necessary to see our country thrive and to grow. Father, thank you for this meeting. We pray that everything that we do, everything that we say, will glorify you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 for being here and putting us on. I appreciate that and hopefully we won't have a whole lot of interruptions here that we can exactly do that. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know how many people know what you went through, but I do, and uh, it is wonderful to see you behind that camera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the Secretary gave out the minutes. Has anybody had a chance to go over them? If you just take a couple minutes to look over, our last meeting we had at the vault was absolutely super. A very good turnout. Uh, we were able to recognize a young man who is right now in Florida with Governor DeSantis. Uh, they are doing the, uh, correct me, Heather, what is it? It is uh, the Grand Gen Z pack. Okay, and it has to do with? The Grand Gen Z pack is the younger generation, the Generation Z um, young leaders that are coming forth. I think Ron DeSantis is doing, Governor Ron DeSantis is doing one of their keynote speakers, and then I think Delegate Hannah is doing something that has to do, he's doing a speech that has to do with being a young, young leader. Young leader. And, uh, I mean, I know all the other counties or states have young leaders they're proud of, but boy, I tell you, I am very proud of this young man. I'm very proud of our county commissioner. Uh, Garrett Cole's doing an outstanding job. And we have three Republican county commissioners. So we have got to make sure that that continues on when January comes around and we get ready to go into the another election cycle. Have you had a chance to look over your minutes? If you have, may I have a motion that we accept them as typed and handed out? BJ has made the motion we accept and stand a second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any nays? 
treasurer's report. We're not broke. <laughs> but we are going to have to build it as we live to do things. Uh, I, I gave a check. Uh, I thank our county commissioner, uh, Dr. Adkins. He and his wife sent us a check to help with the West Virginia Day. They couldn't be there. And she said, what can we do? And I said, we can send a check. And so that's exactly what she did. So do I have a motion we accept the Treasurer's Court as given out? Who to accept as presented? Uh, Greg uh, Bozo, uh, motion we accept it. Carolyn seconded. All in favor, aye. Uh, uh, all right, we'll put it away for an audit. <coughs> Now, Barbara Goodnight got a hold of me a couple times and she had me call her yesterday morning and she got exposed to COVID. Although she and her husband both had two shots, she just felt it was better to stay away for about a week from people to give the chance that if it was anything that she would have it. So uh, she has been an excellent committee member and we're very fortunate she came on because she's worked. And that's what that's what we want. Um, like we were talking about West Virginia Day, very successful. Even though we tried to get blown away, Senator Hamilton, thank you so much. Uh, he came down and stayed and helped. Uh, we did some redistricting fund, which he's going to talk about. Uh, we had um, a few people come by and take pay. You know, the wind tried to make Pollyanna out of all of us, but we got through very well. I can't think of any other old business. Do you all know of anything old that we need to talk about? Uh, going on to new business, county fairs, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm going to go maybe one day and say hi, but we just can't get everything. There's just no way. And uh, so I think the next things we're going to look at is a potato festival. Uh, we'll, yes, ma'am. The fee's been paid. Okay. okay. Fee's been paid. So what we'll do is we'll set up Friday afternoon, stay there Friday evening, uh, be there Saturday. I need a truck so we can put a banner on it, some flags. Maybe if we could get all of our elected Republican officials in the back of that truck that they could ride and wave. I mean, we'd feel the back of the truck up to think about. With the potato festival? With the potato festival? With the potato festival? No plug, but a truck. So think about it. Get with me, and we will uh, sort of toward the end of August get all that together, okay? But we will be in the parade, and we will have a uh, booth. The other thing is, BJ, mm -hmm. do you have your bill? from where you bought that stuff, the West Virginia flags and everything? Uh, somewhere. Do you know how much you, do you, know how much you spent? No, no, no. No, no, no. no. I got my money. You get your money. I need something that you need to pass the Buzz, check with her. Give her a check. And then uh, we will. Okay. Because the, uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because I need to get some more stuff. And I don't want you paying for it. I like to have some giveaways, either pens, pencils, the bands, okay. something to give for the potato festival. Okay. And I'll leave that to you. Would you get us some stuff to give out? Okay. Richwood Festival car or truck in the parade. So we'll talk about that because it's going to be, they're, they're just running consecutive. I mean, we don't have time to, to relax on that. Craigsville Fall Festival car or truck in the parade. Again. We're not going to go big this year, but next year we will. Mike, if you don't know it, we do have some pretty doggone good ones. Oh, that's great. That's great. And in the uh, Potato Festival Parade, in you know, an election year, in, uh, probably in any year, you can see anywhere from 2,500 to 7,000 people behind the streets. Wow. It can get big. It really does. Uh, participation by all candidates and office holders. Hey, Lawrence. Uh, I, I want everybody who is uh, an office holder, 
for, uh, and, and I don't know if you're going to have interims, I don't know when you're going to get called to a special meeting or anything like that, but if you're available, I want you to show your face. Because guess what? We're going to have to get you reelected. It, we don't have time to pull. If one year's down and all of a sudden you're picking them up. Let me go over a couple things that's not on your agenda, which I know is not really legal, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'd like to have a motion that we sponsor Jim Gilbert's golf tournament this coming Saturday. Last year we sponsored with a $100 gold sponsor. Could I have a motion? Heather's made a motion. A second of all approval. Aye. 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 Nice. For $100, right? Hundred dollars, right? Okay. To the Jim Gilbert uh, Foundation, it. or uh, okay. Just get with BJ; she'll help you out. Okay. Uh, Christmas banquet. Christmas banquet is December the fourth. If there is no problem with that, it's going to be at the convention center. I've already talked with them, and it's on in pencil. I have sent a letter to the governor. I got back a. Uh, comment that they couldn't commit right now because they did not know what was going to be happening statewide for Christmas events at that time. But now Roland Stauffer has taken over where he was at Cary, uh, what was his chief of state? Uh, right here. Right, okay, yep. Roman's over there. So Roman had sent me a note, he said just keep getting in with me. So maybe we can get something there and we can get him to be our guest speaker. If not, uh, It'll be, I'll be making a quick clip. Okay. <laughs> he says I'm going to So we're, we're going to do that. I talked to Charlene. She said when we were ready, she'd make our tickets. So we're just going to have, have a thing. Can I appoint a committee right now? And this committee will take care of doing the uh, award ceremony for the Soaring Eagle, for the Republican of the Year, and for the Volunteer of the Year. And if I could, Carolyn, would you be on that for me this year? Heather, will you be on that for me this year? Medina, will you be on that for me this year? Okay, and I would like to have a gentleman. Greg Bezo, will you help us with that? Sure. I'll Greg Bezo. And I've already talked with Carolyn and uh, BJ about going ahead and getting our soy needle, so we'll get that. Uh, I went to the Central West Virginia meeting in Yonkers, and it was really a good meeting. So if you ever get a chance to go for the women's and meet with them, they're, they're moving along pretty well. And they had a place map that was really neat, and they had it out for everybody, and if you didn't use it, they picked it up. Because it had. And so I had, did you all see that on the, uh, can I put it on our account? Uh, $250, 90 dollars. And that's not too bad because we could use them for the Christmas banquet. We could use them for any kind, not every day, but not all the you know, meetings here. But we could use them and it was, it was kind of nice. So I thought if that would be something we'd be interested in, uh, we would get them and try them one time shot. Could I get a motion if it is good with you that we try it for one time for $90? And this is Barbara uh, Goodnight's son, I think, son in law that does this for you. Any problems? I just thought it was for. Okay, it's a placemat that says Nicholas County Republican Party, uh, conservative. Uh, you sent us a text with the market, if I remember right. Something, I can't remember if I did it. You just kept it there while here. It right. Pardon me just a second. Maybe a picnic yeah. next year? That's not a bad idea. Okay, let's hold off. And she said they can get them at any time, and I'll tell her, okay? So we'll hold off on that until we get ready to maybe next year's picnic. 
I don't know if you all been getting it, but I've been getting on my memories, the picnic that we had the last time, and it just, I love those memories. So. Uh, okay, I'm going to introduce any of our legislative leaders that are here. Would you stand up and just shout out and say hi? Hello, Tully. Hello, Tully. Senator Hamilton. Okay, very good. Um, if I can, I would like to bring uh, Senator Hamilton up first to talk about redistricting and what's going to happen there and what's going to happen here in Somerset on a couple of weeks. Senator Hamilton, would you come please? Got up and I said, "One, you, 
could have is you could have four senators and they split your county. He stood up and said, well, we don't want to be split. So, uh, and I don't think it's a good idea that you be split. So, but that's, uh, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Uh, but it's, uh, there's 12 meetings throughout the state, all around the state, and then they're having three virtual meetings which they haven't decided where they're going to occur at. August the 4th is a Wednesday. It's got a choice for an eye, isn't it? I where is it? Yeah. It's going to be at the, the armory. Six to eight. Yeah. Okay. That's what they say it too. Okay. All right. Uh, six to eight at the armory. Also, we're going to be doing a tour of the Summersville Dam for some of the redistricting committee. I will be leading that because um, we had some people that wanted to look at the hydroelectric plant. Um, I think that's going to start at one, one to two, okay. roughly, depending on when everybody gets into town. Um, the other thing with the house districts, we're redistricting into 100 single member districts, so that will be something to pay attention to. Um, the redistricting committee needs to hear about what we want. And how we want our boundaries drawn because uh, what we have to ground out as Republicans is, is there's going to be a lot of talk from the Democrats about gerrymandering. This is the first time Republicans have been in charge of redistricting for eons here <coughs> in the state. So we need to make sure that our voices are loud and clear and uh, we won't have our final numbers I think until almost like the September-ish is what I'm hearing. So what you're hearing? Well, the, what's making this difficult and it's going to put us under the gun <coughs> final census figures won't be out until September 30th. We've got to have this done by November 6th. November 6th. Because you have to live within your district. People that are going to run have to live within their district. They don't know where their districts will be. Right. right. Okay. Can you be the speaker for us here in Euclid County? Yeah. Please, because you're going to know what is happening and if you would, you know, fish for our, our interest. Are you going to be here too? Yes. Okay, and you can push to the center. The center. The center. The center. Is okay. there any way we could uh, get a copy or a plan of what they have planned? Well, see, so that's the purpose of these meetings. So then they're going to go in and formulate some maps. And the areas that's, that's growing in West Virginia are the eastern panhandle and right. Montgomery County. Right. You know, so they got to start there and come down this way so and you keep in mind we're also doing congressional and we're going for three districts to two and the big so. thing with that is are you going to go north to south or east to west right. with the congressional so that's something you want to look at quite honestly it would be my personal take that we go north to south on that because i feel our county has more in common with the southern counties and the coal fields of west virginia versus splitting us right sideways right our issues here in Nicholas County, I feel, are totally different than what the Eastern Panhandle has and what uh, Mon County has, what the what the Northern Panhandle has. I think we relate more to what goes on in the Southern coal fields. Is my take. So let's have a good crowd at this. Yeah, yeah. we need to. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Everybody, just out. mark your calendar. Be there at six o'clock. Don't be late. Okay, six o'clock. I'm oh, sorry. Five yeah, five if you want to eat. I'm sure they'll have something to drink. Or one o'clock if you want to go on the tour. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Can you email everybody? Yeah, I'm going to get it all set up. Okay, yes. did you hear this? She will email out or put out on our uh, messenger what time they're going to meet. And if any of us want to go and meet that time, the day they need to go do this. Is that to the gay thing? Yes. Heather, <laughs> yes, is there please. anything I can do to help with the tour? Please let me know. I will check. He said he would buy it. He'll do that. That's right. Press it down. Thank you. I mean, right now we don't know for sure precinct by precinct. But county by county, Nicholas County is proposed to stay the same. Lost population on the east side well, and gained on the southern side of the county. Do we know which county is gained on the population? Not, not yet because the the Census Committee nationally has taken those all down, all those, oh, that's a you know, so they're, I know in, in my, in, in the 11th district, Upshur County was the only county that had grown, and it was hard for like maybe 
25 or 50 feet. Frank's warehouse. Yeah. But I can get it. Well, Heather, do you, do you happen to have the map of how the uh, delegate districts are broke up right now? I do. Would you take and put that on uh, I'll put it on message. or email it to us where we can print it off? I mean, I may even have some historical stuff about how things were done before. I don't know that I do, but I, have, I would have to dig back and check that. That way that we could look at it and know what's uh, happening. Figure okay. out where we want to be. Yeah. Um, and the biggest thing for Nicholas County, I feel, um, the single member districts here doesn't affect us. It would affect our neighbors over in Fayette County because they're a three member district. So, right. they, see, that's where I end up voting. Right. Three districts. So, you would, there, Kanawha County, which may not be necessarily a bad thing, and Mon County will be a big thing as well. And of course, the Eastern Panhandle, I suspect that they'll gain some seats because they crack. Oh, that's, that's, that's the that's suburb of DC. Which now. is the yeah, yeah. like, yeah. And I also may say, if you have an uh, idea or a thought that you think give it to Heather and that way she knows what we're thinking and be there because this is our time to speak up and to let our voices be heard what we want to see. And that. I've got the list of the redistricting committee members and so if you can't participate in one of the hearings or one of the virtual hearings, maybe email them and kind of let your thoughts be known too. I can get that information to you That's as right. well. Um, all of the email addresses of course are on the legislative website but um, I'll get to the members if you need to look up and that's anything thing. that you think is pertinent put it out okay um, um, I'm going to tell you also on Saturday July 22nd in Mount Nebo St. Patrick it's the belated St. Patrick's Day parade um, line up starts at 10 <coughs> the parade starts at 1 I will be participating in that and then also the Greenbrier County GOP is having a large event over in Crawley West Virginia 20 right. bucks a ticket Kim Clasic is coming down from Baltimore uh, to be the. Uh, Ben's been a hard of me, and I think you all were going to be gone, and I said you. That's the day of the parade. It is yeah. the day. It's the yeah. same day as the parade. Yeah. Like there's so yeah. many things going on. And that's the same day as the same Nicholas day. County Fair. The fair's going on too. The fair's going on. Back on your refreshment. Okay, let me uh, <laughs> let me bring something else up to you, Paul, yeah, because I did send it to you. Uh, if you remember, the they were Miami. talking about uh, and Bill was sitting in the road about it too about closed primaries and actually Mike you might be able to even kind of talk about this too because years ago we had closed primaries only person who could vote in a primary as a Republican had to be a registered Republican and then we opened it up to let people who were independents but you had to ask and we for I don't know how many years were the only ones and all of a sudden it's the Democrats started to come in and they opened it up and I think the big concern is that you may get someone who is uh, going to run and uh, they, they need that extra vote and so they go talk to their independent friends but come over and vote and vote for me and a lot of times you may not get the person that you'd like to have in there in there because of the fact that they've pulled in these voters. Uh, but then again, there's pros and cons to everything. We have got to have the independent voter to be able to win in a lot of our county elections. Not necessarily Nicholas County now because we are a red county. But you, you need that independent voter to win. So you've got, it's, it's kind of like on both hands a situation. So uh, there has been a resolution come out. We're going to have a state meeting uh, in Bridgeport, Clarksburg, uh, the end of August, and they're wanting to bring this resolution up to put us back into having a closed primary. Whether it'll get to the floor, whether it'll get voted on, I don't know. So that's where we're at right now. So we will just have to like. And I know that uh, the center probably would like to address on this just a hair because as soon as I sent that out on our messenger, it got a hold of me. <laughs> so we talked. So, uh, Bill? Well, it, I think it's coming from Jefferson County. It is. And I think the individual's got some hard work because someone's elected the county commission and he didn't think they were a decent Republican or what have you, but anyway. And I've talked to a couple of people on the redistricting for the, uh, I got the uh, but on the committee, on the resolution committee, and they said that's been proposed twice in 
resolution committee has never voted for it, brought it out to the full committee. So, uh, but I think it's a bad idea. We're gaining, we're growing. So why do you want to change now? Party chairman, I'd love to hear this. <laughs> okay, you're <laughs> all. Sometimes, sometimes uh, people can't Thank stand, they, they can't stand growth. <laughs> well, I get that question all the time. Most of the time. <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. Thank you for that information because everything we put forth here is very, very important. And it's my pleasure right now to introduce uh, a friend first, mm -hmm. uh, a colleague. Uh, just we go way back and I'll let him tell you about being right up here about 11 years ago and it's my pleasure Mike Stewart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't worry. Anybody need a refill of coffee? What are you drinking? <coughs> Unsweet. Unsweet. Unsweet and coffee. So I have no doubt you're going to be able to hear me in the back. No doubt about it. And I was blessed with a uh, preacher's voice and uh, probably didn't get to church enough. But, uh, but you can always hear me in the back of the room regardless. But I want to thank Ben Jean for inviting me up. And we do have a long history. And I have a long history with Summersville. In fact, I was recently here for the law enforcement parade, if any of you were at that. And that was a remarkable event. And it came at a critical time, I think, for America, for West Virginia, for law enforcement across the board. Too many folks in law enforcement today feel disrespected. They've got low morale. We're losing folks in law. This is a, a, a coming crisis. To those senators, delegates who are here, you're going to have to deal with this, I guarantee you. Because we're losing more folks than we're gaining. And we need more law enforcement. I tell, the, I tell folks this all the time, and I'll address the issue about should we have closed primary, open primary. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. And I always tell folks that uh, I, I've been the most blessed guy in the world. Tomorrow's my 25th wedding anniversary. And, uh, and I've got the greatest partner next to me. Uh, and i got to tell you, she came at a critical time for me. We've got two beautiful kids. I've just been the luckiest guy. Uh, from the top to the bottom, great parents. I always said if there was a book written about my life, it would be called From a Holler in Barber County. I don't know how many of you know where Barber County's at in Philippi. But my grandma Opal, when I ran those statewide ads, and I understand the Americans for Prosperity Group didn't like me spending those dollars on it, but we ran those ads for a purpose. People like my grandma Opal being taken advantage of. How many phone calls do you get asking whether your car warranty's expired? All the time. <laughs> right? Quit calling me about my warranty. How many of you get a call saying your social security number was compromised? Happens all the time. I was sitting with the Secret Service at an event with the President of the United States, and I got a call saying that my Social Security number had been compromised uh, of all the times. And uh, and I still remember, I actually played along, and I went through and talked to the guy on the other end, waiting for him to pick up. And I said, hey, do you understand you called a government phone, and I'm the United States Attorney for the Southern District of West Virginia, a presidential appointee, who's been confirmed by the USA. This is illegal to even call me on this phone. His reaction, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Your social security number's been compromised. <laughs> I tell you though, from a holler in Barber County, and I, I, when I was a young boy, my dad coal miner 50 years, my grandfather's coal miners. I've just done some of the most amazing things over the course of my life. I come from a big family on my dad's side, about 64 grandkids when we quit counting. That includes great grandkids, nine brothers and sisters, and uh, my grandparents each had 11 brothers and sisters, both of them, can you imagine? And uh, my mom always used to say, a lot of love in that family. I said, no, they just need a lot of workers in that family, right, to work that farm back then. And so, but I learned a lot from that hollow, whether it was those, uh, gosh, whether it was butchering, put, butchering the pigs or, or uh, that, salt, uh, that salt barn, and, uh, those uh, wiener roasts where uh, you always try to get the ice cream to get frozen and never did, if you know what I'm talking about. Right, you'd sit there forever cranking the darn thing. You'd end up drinking the ice cream. And it was good, though. Sure, it was always good. It was great. It was a different country back then. But I came from a family, I can tell you, even to this day, 
uh, the idea that I would go off to college and get a degree, and I got an accounting degree and a political science degree at the time, I said, geez, maybe I'll be a politician who can balance a budget. And then I realized they don't need any of that. Right? We aren't balancing any budgets as politicians, except in West Virginia we do. And, but if you add it all in, I don't know if it actually balances at the end of the day. The idea of become a Republican Party chairman, I was from a big Democrat family. My grandma and grandpa, I still remember, they lived in, just like that commercial, say my grandma Opal and my grandpa Bud, his serious drinking problem, but you know, he served his country incredibly well. He saw some things he could never talk about. And I still remember him and his, uh, his best friend would pop over to my house in that little red Ford, and uh, they'd always bring me a Mountain Dew. I mean, I'm just telling you, I learned things in Barber County that I use every single day, and I think back to that family. My grandpa, they're a big Democrat family. They didn't have clean running water in that house. It was acid mine drainage. I still remember as clear as I'm looking over there, that creek, creek ran red. It ran orange. And, uh, and then they had well water. And uh, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Things are so much better in America and West Virginia today than they were back then. But my grandma, we still had to bring in gallons of water. They still use that to wash their clothes. They still used it to bathe in, right? This was a great challenge, but this wasn't a challenge just for my family. I had no idea we were poor growing up. I thought we were some of the wealthy kids. But I look back on those days, but that, that big Democrat family, and when it came time to try to get running water in that holler right between Nutter Fort and Philippi along Route 257, my grandma went knocking on doors in her late 60s and uh, she got enough signatures on that to ultimately get running water. It wasn't Rob or Bird that got that running water in there. And I gotta tell you, I came from a family, we weren't politically connected. I didn't come from a big political dynasty. I don't have a fancy last name, and we certainly don't have a lot of dollars in our bank account. It's just been hard work. I just learned you work hard, and you inspire your family, and you go out there and you make it happen every single day. My family, nobody has a college degree. Nobody has an advanced degree. I'm the only one to this point that, still, that, that has an advanced degree. I have a law degree. Now, there's two undergraduate degrees. In my entire family, there may be a handful of folks that even have a college degree. They work in the coal mines. They work in poultry farms. And I saw so much poverty over the course of my life. And I know sometimes it's hard for me when I'm telling my kids because they've lived a pretty blessed life. It's hard for me to share with them exactly what life was like growing up. And I was lucky with a great mom and a great dad. I tell you, my dad and mom, dad retired after about 50 years in the coal mines. And uh, they, they spend their winters down in Florida, and they spend their summers back up here with the extended family. We've got our family reunion next month, and I holler in Barber County up on the top of the hillside there. No running water, no electricity. But the years pass by, and it seems like the divide grows bigger. I look at this, and this is really the picture of West Virginia, right? We don't have enough sewer and water projects. We just don't. The idea that a little boy was going to grow up in West Virginia, become a Republican Party chairman from a Democrat family, for goodness sakes, my grandfather used to sit by the coal-burning fireplace in that little laid house with a tin roof and a holler in Barber County. And he had sitting on that mantle a bust of John F. Kennedy. And you could touch anything you wanted in that house, but by God, you touch that John F. Kennedy bust and that poker's coming after you. It's true. It's true. I still remember as a boy, and I'm telling too many stories, but I've got so many stories growing up. I'm just a blessed guy for the stories I can tell and the things I've seen. I remember it was one Christmas, and my, uh, my dad decided to get my grandpa, I don't know why, a parrot. Got him a parrot. And I still remember we dropped that parrot. This parrot was a nasty parrot. We named him after Bear Bryant from Alabama. <laughs> named him parrot. Figured he could at least be a winner. <laughs> but that parrot, we went back up about a week later. And uh, in fact, we went up because Grandpa called my dad and said, why, why don't you come up and, uh, and bring the grandson, stop up here and, and uh, see us. And my dad said, well, I might be able to get there. And he said, no, 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 you need to come tonight. You need to come tonight. So during the course when we got up there, I was always excited to get up to Grandma's house. It wasn't the cleanest place in the world, but it was it was home. Like at Christmas time, all these hundreds of people, she always had something under the tree for everybody and never forgot a person. All the knitted things, the pair of underwear, 
the socks. I look back on that at the time, I didn't appreciate it. Now, I'd give anything to go back just for one of those Christmases. Yeah. Those oysters that we're cooking, oh, wow. remember? And uh, special times, but my grandpa said to my dad, he goes, I've had two damn nuisances in my life. One was a pony, the other's that damn parrot. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get that parrot out of here. <laughs> so we brought that parrot home. My dad let the parrot fly around the house. The parrot went outside the door. I have no idea where the parrot's at, but I haven't seen any parrots around here any time recently. No, I've been a lucky guy. And so big Democrat family, John F. Kennedy was a legend in my household. But I say this, right? You're talking about gerrymandering and uh, redistricting. Like, the Democrats never did that, did they? No. Never. Never I became a Republican when I was about 19 years old because I looked at my family with the remarkable amount of poverty, no running water at my grandma's house, and said, we gotta try something different. I'm one of those folks that actually is a bona fide, true conservative when it comes to economic issues. I don't need a consultant around me to tell me what to think on these things. I actually believe in capitalism, the greatest gift in the history of mankind. The medicines we have, the, the, the houses that we live in, the society we live in, Capitalism is the greatest gift we've ever known. And we live in a period of time where it's like we're apologizing for capitalism. It's the craziest thing, craziest thing I've ever seen. My grandfather, I remember when I became a Republican, a family said, Grandpa would be turning in his grave if he knew you were the chairman of the Republican Party. So many stories. I still remember, as a, I'll tell you one last story, and I get on to the final portion, because I know it's beautiful outside and you want to go home, you don't want to sit here and listen to a guy tell all these stories. But gosh, as a young guy, I thought Chicago, the band, was coming. And I dated this girl back in high school, like a lot of folks. And I wanted to go to the Chicago concert. They were at the top of their game back then. And they were coming to Morgantown to the Coliseum. I couldn't get tickets. I told Joe Manchin this story, and I don't know that he believes me or not. But you guys remember A. James Manchin? Oh, yeah. Secretary of State? Like, how could you not remember? How many of you got a certificate from the man? <laughs> How many got multiple certificates from him? <laughs> Listen, he was a real character. He was a real character. And so I said, my goodness, I can't get these Chicago tickets. Uh, let me call the Secretary of State. I'm sure all those statewide office holders get these extra tickets. And A. James Mansion, I'm sure, can go into the Chicago concert. So I literally picked up the phone. I looked it up. I still remember. We had the internet back then, of course. But I looked up the phone number for Charleston, Secretary of State's office. And I called. She picked up the phone. And I said, hi, it's Mike Stewart. Uh, my dad uh, is a coal miner, and I was just wondering whether the Secretary of State might have any extra Chicago tickets for the uh, concert in Morgantown. And she goes, hold one second. <laughs> hold one second. Next thing I know, it's A. James Manchin on the phone. And he's like, young man, what's your name? And he asks what my dad does, and I say he's a coal miner, and works hard up here in Morgantown. I want to take my girlfriend to the, uh, to the concert. I didn't get tickets, and if you happen to have tickets, I'd like to buy them from you. He says, let me call you back in 15 minutes. I said, I'll never hear from him again. It was exactly 15 minutes later, and the phone rang. It was A. James Manchin. And he said, hey, if you'll meet me at the Ramada Inn at 5 o'clock, I'm bringing you the tickets. Next thing I know, I'm taking my old mobile up there, black with a tan top, pull up to the Ramada Inn. Here comes a helicopter. <laughs> helicopter lands. How many comes the Secretary of State? I've never seen anything like it in my life. Now, at the time, I was excited by it. Now, I'm like, it was paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I get out. The Secretary of State literally says, young man, here's two tickets to the Chicago concert and a $5 bill to buy your girlfriend a root beer to Milky Way. <laughs> a root beer to Milky Way. God's truth. It's remarkable. If he knew I was going to become a future Republican chairman in the state of West Virginia, he won his five dollars back and his Chicago tickets. Listen, we live in a remarkable place. Who, who would have ever thought as a young boy I would ever become a Republican chairman from a family that was so dedicated to the Democrat Party? A family that was steeped in poverty, didn't have any education, certainly didn't have any legacy or future to them except for those coal mines they could work in. I think back, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Jeez, I ain't even thinking about riding. I mean, we're so careful with our kids today. God, my dad used to smoke like a smokestack in the car. 
he used to drink. I could drive by the age of eight like you wouldn't believe from a baseball game. He made it to every baseball game. A great dad. He usually didn't see the end of the baseball game. <laughs> but I always made it home after those things. And I always knew I had a mom and dad who loved me. The idea of being a young boy growing up in that holler with a big family dedicated to the Democrat Party like that, that I'd become a Republican Party chairman, that I'd become the Trump chairman for the state of West Virginia, can you imagine? Of course, I didn't imagine I'd be working for a billionaire from New York City to be the president of the United States either. But what I heard during the course of that campaign, I think I was the first former Republican state chairman in the country to endorse his campaign at a time that was critical to that campaign. Because just like you, when he came down that elevator and he started talking, I started hearing things that were resonating inside of me. I started hearing things that folks would be in an elevator and they would go, I think I like that Trump guy. Right? They would whisper. They were embarrassed to tell. There are people today that you know of that are embarrassed to tell us they support Donald Trump. Not more. But nobody worked harder for this country. Nobody. He continues to work hard. I'll say this, I love Ronald Reagan, because to me, gosh, my grandfathers had passed away at the time. I saw him as that seminal grandfather character in my life at the time, and he led our country so well. You hear the stories that he never took his jacket off in the office, right? He just left, he led with great honor and dignity. But I'll say this, Donald Trump, I never saw anybody work so hard. And his agenda, I don't care what anybody says, I don't back away from that agenda one bit whatsoever. They told him he was crazy for his approach to the Middle East. The Abraham Accords, perhaps the greatest stroke of Mideast peace genius in the history of the Mideast. But yet we've turned our backs on that under the Biden administration. American energy independence, that's good for West Virginia, but it's good for our country. I can go through a long list. Protecting our southern border, are you kidding me? Of course we ought to protect our southern border. And I'm not against immigration, legal immigration, but I don't like lion skippers at Disney World and I don't like them at the border. Wait your turn, come to our country the right way. If you go through the entire Trump agenda, it's a remarkable achievement. Operation Warp Speed to my final point. Now I could go through a whole list of Trump accomplishments. They're remarkable accomplishments. The guy just worked all the time. And I knew people at the White House in fact, I was offered to go to the White House after he won, and I smartly said no, because I probably would have been fired in a few months, right? He's a tough guy to work for, let's just admit it. And he had some scoundrels around him. And I say this, that I love being a Republican. I think I've worked hard. Ben Gene, I know you have many people in this, uh, in this room have dedicated your lives to conservative ideals, to advancing the Republican Party. And we remember when I had that, uh, that bus trip it was the Fire Pelosi and Reed tour. We got rid of one of them. We, for some reason, can't get rid of the other one. But maybe she could have provided good, expensive ice cream for us. So, but I look at that, and I still remember back then, it was hard to get a nexus of folks in a room back then, of Republicans, right? We could go into a phone booth. But we kept working, and we kept working, and we kept working, and it kept growing, and it kept growing. Why? because folks heard what we had to say, and they agreed with it. We can do better in West Virginia. We have always been able to do better in West Virginia. And with our numbers in the legislature today, 77 in the House, 23 in the State Senate, a perfect 100, there is no piece of legislation, none, that we can't pass. This ought to be the seminal call for our party, is to pass the greatest legislation ever that can lead us to where we need to go in terms of West Virginia. You know, when I was U.S. Attorney, the idea of being a young boy and becoming U.S. Attorney, that was like impossible. That was never going to happen. And heck, I became a corporate lawyer. But when I was there, I can tell you, we grew that office. We had some big takedowns. I was in Somersville a few times. These Detroit drug dealers, listen, I know we live in a period of time where all we talk about is redemption and second chances. Right? We want to be nice. We want folks to understand that we're empathetic people. But I can tell you this, there's a proper place for criminals behind bars, and we shouldn't apologize for that. Violent criminals should be behind bars, not on our streets. Redemption, second chances I believe in, but those things aren't free. And I'm worried, I'm a little worried, 
that we're headed down a dangerous path on the Republican side in West Virginia. I'm going to always talk about law enforcement. I proposed as U.S. Attorney and it passed the legislature, thank you, Senator, and some of you may have voted for this, but the back the blue license plate, I don't think we honor these folks enough for what they do all the time. My license plate, you'll see on my vehicle, is license plate 001. One of the great honors of my life is having law enforcement issue me license plate 001. I'm not sure the governor loved that they gave me license plate 001. <laughs> but I support the governor, and I have license plate 001. <laughs> and so, but listen, we, we need to think about this issue of law enforcement. We've got more money now coming from Washington than we've ever seen before. <laughs> Let's just give you a couple issues real quick. We have about the same number of state troopers today in West Virginia as we did in the 1970s. Same number. There are counties in West Virginia that don't have a, a, a precinct or a barracks for state troopers. I'll give me a Rowan County. In fact, I don't even know the numbers here in Nicholas County. I, I need to, to learn what the numbers are. In Rowan County, they have a police force of one, and they have no state troopers there to support them. We need to be thinking about this, right? One, we're losing, folks. What happens if the one in Rome retires? Give you a couple other issues that we got to be thinking about. Domestic violence. It's a big deal for me. As U.S. Attorney, we did a lot with domestic violence. Do you know in West Virginia, you can beat your wife twice and it's not a felony? This doesn't make any sense to me. We should never tolerate domestic violence in any way, shape, or form. We need to root it out. And folks who are committing uh, domestic violence, it can be guys or women, but primarily it's guys. We need to lock them up. They need to pay a price for this. We've got a whole host of those things. Ethics reform in Charleston. I can tell you, most people, maybe not the folks in this room, they're cynical as to Charleston and Washington. We need serious ethics reform in Charleston. We do, and it needs to have teeth. PSC reform. When's the last time we had a proposal to increase your electricity rates or your water rates and it didn't get approved by the PSC? This is crazy. They work for us. Right. We ought to be setting the rules. And so listen, there are times where we need increased rates, for sure. And it's tough with our topography. But we ought to be thinking about these things. I got a whole list of things we ought to be thinking about. And we ought to fix these things. And we got the numbers, and we shouldn't apologize for it. We live in a very unique time, too, where we're being questioned all the time. We always have to start every discussion with, I'm not a racist. <laughs> this is ridiculous. We're in a cultural revolution in this country. I told Hoppy this today. Anybody listen to Hoppy today? Uh, Get this critical race theory guy on there trying to explain it away, and I said to Hoppy, I said, you can't have an illogical conversation trying to sound like you're not racist by conducting that interview, right? You've already lost at the beginning. One thing I love about Donald Trump, he is not a racist. He is not a bigot. If you look at his record, it is a remarkable record. Lowest unemployment for African Americans in the history of the country. Lowest unemployment for women in the history of the country. His organizations had more women and African Americans advanced in his organizations than just about anybody else who's been in charge of leading business. I don't think there's a racial bone in that man. He just wants performance. That's a good thing. But you know what he does that we don't do? He doesn't start by saying, I'm not a racist. Why? Because he knows he's not a racist. He goes about his policies and he lets the left and the crazy media hounds call him names that are just absurd and we let it sit. And we let it sit. I love the man. I think he's a great uh, president. I think he could be another great president. And certainly, uh, the, doll, the, the, the gas prices here are just remarkable. Let me say just a couple other things about being a U.S. attorney. It was a remarkable responsibility. The power of a U.S. attorney is immense. You can indict a ham sandwich. It's true. But you shouldn't indict things just because you can't. You ought to indict things because it's the right thing to do. I would get calls from folks all the time saying, you need to indict these people. You need to indict those people. I always believed I need something called evidence. And it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat. I, I cleaned up the Supreme Court. Why? 
I didn't care what party they were from. I didn't care that Alan Lockwood was a Republican. I said this then, I say it now, I'll continue to say it. There's no such thing as a little bit of public corruption. We've grown to believe that it's okay if you're a county commissioner and you cheat just a little. Just a little. It's not okay. We shouldn't tolerate it. We need to put the clamps down on folks who do that. So I'm just telling you, that cleaning up of the Supreme Court, that big raid we did in Huntington, the largest raid in the history of West Virginia. We had over 250 law enforcement and National Guardsmen on the street. Washington Post only cared I had National Guardsmen out there. I still remember when I met with that team, every law enforcement, state, federal, local, we had working that day. Why? Because Marshall University was under assault. Moms and dads were afraid to send their kids to Huntington. Why? Because drugs and violence in the streets, and we should never tolerate that. When I went down to Huntington, the reason we did that was two, about two weeks after I became U.S. Attorney. I went in and met with the Democrat mayor of Huntington and said, we're going to stamp this out. I don't care whether I'm popular, and I don't care what people say about me, but we're going to make it possible for Ann Hazel to walk down the street without fear of being mugged, being robbed, or being assaulted. That was the challenge in Huntington at the time. If you went to the local Kroger's, folks would only go out during the daytime. They were afraid to go out at night. You should never feel that way in America, and you should never feel that way in your home. So when we conducted that rate, 250 law enforcement officers and National Guardsmen, targeting 100 votes at the uh, state and federal level, that was a glorious day. The questions I got from the Washington Post, why do you have the National Guard there? I was like, I want more. Bring me more. In fact, I said to General Hoyer at the time, I still remember, he got very, very quiet. And I said, General Hoyer, on that day, because this was in the planning stages for a while, I want every bridge shut down, and I want boats in the river. So when those drug dealers from Detroit think they're getting out of here, we're going to pick them up. General Hoyer got very, very quiet. Very quiet. And I said, uh, what's, what's wrong, General? And he said, it'll, it'll look like martial law. And I said, but just for a little while. Just for a little while. Listen, on the issue of drugs, we, we, we're treating this like it's a law enforcement issue, <laughs> like it's a health crisis. It is a health crisis. There is not a street, town, church, school. I challenge you to find a family that hasn't been impacted by the drug crisis. Do you know we've lost more people in the drug crisis from the scourge of drugs than all the major skirmishes and wars combined? Folks, you may not like to hear this. We are in a war for the heart and soul of this country. The cartel declared that war. We need to use those war machines for one very justifiable purpose. Take the cartel out where they sit, where we know where they are, and where they produce these drugs. Our nation is under assault. Every street, every school, every child, every family. Three people I want to share with you. Stacy Archer, you probably never heard her name. Her son, Joel Archer. Her story's remarkable. She's those heroes that we run into all the time that we may not realize at the supermarket. Joel Archer was 24 years old. He was a functioning drug addict. She got that knock at her door saying that Joel had succumbed uh, to that terrible event of a heroin overdose. And so what did she do? She took that anger, that sadness, and she helped form something called Recovery Point in Charleston and Huntington, which serves a lot of folks who are suffering with substance abuse every day. She turned it from something horrible that she lives with every single day. She turned it into hope for her community. Jessica Woodrow. These are the people I got to meet as U.S. Attorney. It was my greatest gift. I carry in my pocket, not today, but every single day. It breaks my heart. I carry in my pocket every single day the pictures. This is Joel. He's a beautiful kid. He's a beautiful kid. I can tell you the story behind every person in my wall, every one of them. Jessica Woodrum, pretty remarkable young lady. Supreme Court actually made a bad ruling on this, but I love the folks who are in our Supreme Court right now, so I don't want you to take us the wrong way. Her husband, her husband, right? You're supposed to love, honor, and protect your spouse. 
he got real jealous, thought she was having an affair, which ultimately we found out later she was, but it's no basis for treatment of the kind that uh, this, uh, this uh, brought. Domestic violence is U.S. attorneys hard to prosecute. You have to have a gun involved or you have to cross the border to be able to bring something. In this case, we couldn't find either, but I still took it on as U.S. attorney and we did a lot of media over it. Jessica Woodrum, her husband hounded her to the point she was in Charleston one night and he got a hold of her and just kept calling, kept calling, kept calling. And he says, I'm going to meet you halfway. I'm going to meet you halfway. She knew what was coming that night. He used to beat her all the time. But he used to only last for about an hour, get slapped around, right? It's okay, just slapped around a little bit, kicked in the gut. It's not okay. But that night when he picked her up, as soon as she got inside the door, he stripped her down. Not a stitch of clothes on her. He beat her, and he beat her. It chokes me up, thinking about the strong mom that I have, and the great people that I know in West Virginia. This is not consistent with the character of our people. He then tied her down on the bed, and he beat her, and he beat her. He kept just hammering her in the stomach. He was trying to bust her breasts. It was terrible stuff. When she started to pass out about eight hours later, he made her take barbiturates to keep her up. Caffeine pills. This lady prayed, this lady prayed that he would have a gun and shoot her. She prayed about it. He didn't. In fact, she says to him at one point, please just, just kill me, just kill me. He beat her all night. He beat her to the next day. Their two kids, think about this, the father of their children calls the mother-in-law, her mom, the next morning and says, hey mom, uh, we're running late, we got some errands to run. Uh, I'll pick the girls up at the end of the day. He continued to beat her. Continued to beat her the entire day. Until her mom knew something was wrong and came knocking on that door. And then she kept coming, knocking on that door, and police came. It's a tragic story. That conviction got overturned because the ruling from the court was you can't be kidnapped inside your house. You can be kidnapped inside your house. One final story about somebody named Victoria Douglas. Victoria was like every one of our children. She's one of these pictures in here. She's a beautiful, beautiful young lady. And uh, in fact, her mom is in real estate, not a big real estate developer, has an office building and some trailer parks. And uh, Victoria had grown up. She's a young girl, went down to Florida, was living in Florida, came home for a long weekend. Was gonna be there for the week. And like every mom and dad, we always say, if you're like me, anytime my kids are home in the house at 11 o'clock, it, it's a good night. I sleep better just knowing that they're there. But Victoria had gone out earlier that evening and got home by 11. She kissed her mom goodnight and said, I'm going to go to bed. She went out to see a friend. Well, she went out to see a friend all right. Next morning, and her two little nieces were staying at the house. They were four and five years old. Next morning, mom doesn't understand why Victoria's not out of bed because Victoria's always an early riser. She always gets up early. But she said, maybe she's tired from her trip back from Florida. All right, so I'm going to let her sleep. About 9.30, she said to, uh, to, to Sissy and, and the little boy, go jump on that bed and roust your sissy about it. Get her up. Tell her it's time for breakfast. They were going to go shopping that afternoon. What that four and five year old saw, and I won't go into the detail of it, was one of the most ghastly things they will never get out of their head. But that young girl had used heroin the night before after she got home and kissed her mom on the cheek. And in that heroin was some fentanyl. And the dealer told her, be careful with this. This is powerful stuff. Be careful with this. Death came so quick, she died with the phone on her heart with half the text written out. The little kids ran out of that room screaming. Mom ran and she didn't know exactly what had done. When you see somebody, and I have, I have embraced too many moms and dads to the point of their greatest grief, you know when you see them. And mom knew. Every parent knows. But mom did something I will never have the courage to do. And it uh, is a remarkable thing. Mom 
took that cell phone from her dead daughter's hand and used her dead daughter's thumb to unlock that phone. And wouldn't you know, about 15 minutes later, there was a phone call to that phone and it said, how you doing? That was pretty powerful stuff. And mom said, I'm dead and hung it up. The police came. We were able to take that phone and link back all those communications. And I gotta tell you, these big tech companies, they don't make it easy on us. They want a whole bunch of things we don't have time to talk about tonight though. They want it to be so private that these, uh, these folks who are abusing our kids, these drug dealers, these are gonna become interstates for criminality. We in West Virginia need to make it very clear to Apple and Facebook and all those other social media companies law-abiding citizens' rights come first. We took that phone. We were able to prosecute him. Without getting into the detail, she had plenty of drugs in her system, multiple drugs. For me to get the maximum sentence, I need something called a but-for opinion from a forensic uh, investigator. And we hired the best out of SMU, the best. We couldn't get the but-for opinion. I could only get a most likely opinion. So what we decided to do is, even though I couldn't charge on the heaviest counts, we tried it in sentencing. And so you can do that. And so we brought in the whole case, the case in chief at sentencing. And, uh, and we got that guy 20 years behind bars. And he said, geez, I didn't know what I was selling. I'm sorry, if you're a drug dealer, you ought to know what you're selling and you shouldn't be selling. And so we have a tough record. I have a tough record as U.S. Attorney. Some folks didn't like it. But I can tell you what, you don't want that guy living next door again. You don't sure as hell want that guy near your kids. We gotta protect our families. We're all family in West Virginia. I appreciate you taking time tonight to be able to talk with me. Um, I love being U.S. Attorney. I'm back in the private sector now. I'm traveling around talking to a lot of folks. We got a big event this weekend in Point Pleasant. We've got a Trump train that's going to be leaving Ohio and going into Point Pleasant. I'm excited by it. I continue to work with the Trump team. I'm visiting with the president here about a month and a lot of his advisors. And uh, i got to tell you, I don't know what his decision is going to be. I know what I think his decision is going to be. Uh, but it's going to be, you better hold on because uh, make sure your seatbelt's fastened on this one because it's going to, it's going to be an amazing uh, trip. We've got big challenges. Inflation setting in. Oh, yeah. American energy independence. Since when was it a bad thing to use American oil and gas and coal and start buying stuff from overseas? This is crazy time. And so um, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm traveling around talking with a lot of folks. Um, we're talking about the future of West Virginia. On that closed primary thing, I think I wouldn't mess with that anything. It's going too well. Very good. It's going too well. But I'll leave that to legislators to make those decisions. I'll say this, I think it's important for a governor and a legislature to work really close together. I'd love to see some forums across the state right now talking with folks like you to say, how do we build this economy? I don't think there's anything we can't do in West Virginia. When I was U.S. Attorney, I used to recruit the best and brightest from across the country. People said, you can't do that. It'd be hard to recruit them at. Are you kidding? I recruited them from everywhere from L.A to Indiana, to North Dakota, to Massachusetts, to Florida, the best of the best. I had a lot of folks sending me people to hire, people who were politicians who said, you ought to hire this buddy. I didn't hire any of those folks. I didn't hire one person I had a pre-existing relationship with, but I hired the best of brightest. That's what we ought to be doing in West Virginia. We ought not be fixing the system so it layers our back and makes our lives better. We ought to be fixing the system so folks like my grandma and grandpa don't have poisoned well water, and so we encourage these kids back to college. We can do this, and we can do it quickly, but we have to make sure we keep our eyes on the prize, we do it honestly, and that we don't become the Democrat party that we got rid of. We can't let that happen. So it ought to be ethics up here, lobbyists down there. I hope there's no lobbyists here. <laughs> so, tough luck. But we have too much influence from lobbyists all across the board, whether it's Washington. And I tell you, I was going to bring some of my daughter's artwork, because apparently artwork sells for quite a bit in Washington today. And so I was thinking, maybe we could auction some off and I could retire. But I tell you, when my kids were complaining about uh, you know, all these fancy I said, quit complaining. 
If I'm lucky enough someday, you'll become the head of an executive company in China running an energy company. Yeah. <laughs> right? Not a bad gig if you can get it. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here, and I appreciate you listening to me for a while.
on this election thing, there are plenty of improprieties that need to be investigated. President Biden is our president. I'm not denying that whatsoever. But we have 70 million Americans who aren't entirely convinced that Biden won that night. If we end up in an international skirmish and our sons and daughters and brothers and sisters are headed over to another Vietnam and coming back in body bags, I sure as hell want to know that my president was elected fairly and squarely. We, as all Americans, ought to want to make sure that every vote that's, that's counted is legitimate and every legitimate vote is counted. Pretty simple, not hard. And so I'd say this, I don't have a lot of faith that the Republicans in Washington are gonna have our backs here. And I know it may not be popular in this group. I expect Democrats to nail me in the stomach with a knife. I don't expect Republicans to nail me in the back. And so we need a backbone for Republicans in Washington. I think it's different here in West Virginia. We have a good core of strong-willed folks with good ideas in Charleston. And they're making great improvements. But I am not happy with the folks we got in Washington. We got to speak louder. We should have had Donald Trump's back more. We shouldn't apologize for the negative of the negative. Let me say this about Joe Manchin. I hear this all the time from folks. Joe Manchin's just another good Republican. Are you kidding me? There's never been a more comfortable Democrat vote. He's the most powerful man in the world. At least that's what he tells us every day. He's the most powerful man in America. My sister, I love her dearly. She has a high school GED. Her husband has a high school GED. They are good people. They're entrepreneurs. So in her house up in the outskirts of Morgantown, she has on one side of her house a beauty parlor, and on the other side of her house, a pet salon. I tell her all the time, make sure you're not cutting so much hair that the old lady looks like a poodle and the poodle looks like an old lady. You gotta be careful about that. But where I get concerned about this is, her husband, high school TD, 56 years old, great young guy, he has no prospects for future employment beyond what he does. He works for a company called Mylan Pharmaceuticals, now called Viatris. He got his notice about the same time I was being fired from Biden. And I still remember when I got that call. And I said, because they said the president's request your resignation. I said, wait 10 minutes, he'll forget. <laughs> Their reaction was total silence. <laughs> <laughs> but he's soon to be unemployed. And I gotta tell you, the Manchin family's done awfully well with my own pharmaceuticals and in private business. They've done really well. I grew up with fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. How many times have we been fooled by the Manchins? We ought to be smarter than this. We ought not put up with this. And if for no other reason, he's not consistent with the values and character of West Virginia. He voted to convict President Trump twice. He's voted for an amazing number of tax increases. And he always comes to us and pats us on the back and says, I love you, man. I love you, man. Listen, enough of the I love you, man. Thing. Go to Washington, do your job. Stay off that fancy boat. Apparently he's got some boat in Washington. But his daughter made $19 million as she's headed out the door of Milan while my brother-in-law is looking at unemployment at the age of 56 with no prospects. This ain't right. This ain't right. He needs to explain this. Because if he's the most powerful man in the world, why is my brother-in-law looking at unemployment? So I thank you for the question. Long answer is, we need some folks in Washington with a backbone. And people like Mitt Romney, oh, I maxed out to his, to, to his campaign in 2012. I want my money back. <laughs> I want my money back. Right? I, I think it's important that Republicans can be from a broad uh, perspective. You can disagree, but don't be mean spirited about it. Right. And some of the folks in Washington, they talk a great game, they don't get anything done. I knew there was no Russia, uh, I knew it was a Russia hoax. I was attached to that campaign, I worked hard with that campaign. It was the most disorganized campaign in the history of mankind. They couldn't have colluded their way out of a wet paper bag. It was all <laughs> Donald Trump, I'm telling you. And so I knew all along this was fake and it was a hoax. But gosh, every day he got up, he was under assault from the media. 
is under assault from the left. We've let this happen, and uh, we need to be supporting Cuba. And if we get the chance to trade Cuba for a state for California, we might consider it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't see anything changing, but I want the record to be clear, if you want. And it would take a lot of things for that to happen. But I'll say this, uh, I talked with my fellow U.S. attorneys in those places. We were talking, all, I still talk to them all the time. I was sending notes that night to them saying, the country's relying on you. Get out there and find this stuff. I was lucky as a U.S. attorney because I don't really care what people think. I'm going to go out and do my job. If you like it, good. If you don't like it, I don't really care. My wife doesn't like me half the time, and I can live with it. Tomorrow's our 25th. These U.S. attorneys, i got to tell you, they're political creatures to a certain degree. And they like playing the political game. And to find fraud like that that's so well packaged, you've got to dig through a lot of materials. You've got to spend some long nights there. And I don't think it happened. But we need to understand what happened across the country. But I don't know that we're going to get the backbone out of Washington to support us. We need to replace some of those Republicans, I'm telling you right now. So, uh, long answer is I don't have a lot of faith. I do think there's a chance he won. And, uh, but I don't know what the results were. And we should never be in a country where we're not sure who was, who was elected president on that, on that night. This should be pretty simple stuff. All right, thank you. No more questions. You'll be here another hour. <laughs> We got to support law enforcement. And, uh, I gotta tell you, this, this Americans for Prosperity group—I'll probably get in trouble for even bringing it up. Listen, I know they're supposed to be a conservative, uh, right-leaning organization. But you know what? Just because you call yourself a conservative, right-leaning organization, it don't make you a conservative, right-leaning organization. The revolving door at the state level, it's too fast. We need to slow it down. You need to be going behind bars for a period of time. Maybe we need to strengthen uh, the programs inside our law enforcement institutions, our, our, our penal institutions, so that we're doing some rehab, so we're doing some vocational training. Uh, but the idea that we quickly let you back out for you to go back uh, to, to your behavior again, this is ridiculous. And a lot of Republicans, I'm telling you, are starting to buy into this garbage. Uh, we need more state troopers. Uh, we need a GI Bill for law enforcement in America where we help them with their education and their child care. Uh, there are a lot of things we need to be doing. And, uh, and, and Georgia and Tennessee have something called a, uh, a, a the State Bureau of Investigation, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Our, and I love Colonel Cahill at State Police. He's a great man. He's a good man. So don't get me wrong on this. That position is appointed by the governor. I don't care who the governor is, we need an institution at the state level that one speeds up our drug testing, and we got plenty of money to speed it up real quick so we can prosecute quickly, as opposed to a year and year and a half later. But we need this West Virginia Bureau of Investigation to be pulled out of the state police where it's not appointed by any politician and not overseen by any politician. So when there's hijinks in Charleston or at the county levels, we have a free flowing, independent, uh, honest operation that can go in and clean those things up. We shouldn't have to tolerate those things. It's easy to fix. We just have to make sure we keep our, our, our picture on, on the big prize here. But we need about 35% more state troopers. Oh, sure. 35% more state oh, troopers. Yeah. And, I, don't, uh, I don't know what ever happened, but I agree with the capital punishment. So the capital punishment thing, I think there's certain discussions that need to happen in West Virginia. And, and uh, just real, real quick, I keep saying real quick, there's so many things we need to talk about. Hopefully I get to come back and talk about some of these things. Barbara Steele, if you've ever heard that name before. Barbara Steele was on the west side of Charleston. And I pushed Amy Shula Goodman for all my years there to go clean out the west side of Charleston. She said it would look racist. I said it shouldn't matter what it looks like. Those folks want the same things we did. Right. Safe streets, good schools, upward mobility. This isn't hard. There's no difference between black people and white people and Asian people and Native American Indians. There's no difference. We all want the same things. Barbara still got up that morning like every single morning that she got up on the west side of Charleston, right behind a pharmacy. But that day, God had something else in store for her. And there was a, a, a terrible killer that found his way into her home. It's a horrible story. I'm not going to tell you the details. Uh, but she didn't even know this guy. He found his way into her home. He went about his business of assaulting her. 77-year-old woman. 
insulted her, murdered her with a hot with with, with a uh, an antique iron. You've seen them before. And uh, and then he uh, and then he uh, then he split her gut and put her rosary and remote control inside her. Now I'm sorry, folks. I don't have any empathy for that. We need to have a discussion about capital punishment in certain limited instances. No repeat offenders. But I do believe in redemption and second chances. Let me say this. Sure. On the drug front, if we don't help everybody who's become a victim to this, those folks who have fallen prey to the drugs that are coming from Akron and Detroit and Mexico, we're surely lost because there's too many of them. There are sons and daughters. And I do believe long-term treatment, we can, we can cure this. But they need to be some of our most productive folks. And, uh, and so there's two levels, right? These, these demons from Detroit and Mexico, they, they gotta go to a very dark hole. But these kids of ours, we need to make sure we embrace them and love them and tell them it's okay and that we don't carry any animosity to them because there's too many of us today that believe somehow if you were an addict, it was your weakness that you made the mistake. And I gotta tell you, these drugs like fentanyl, it can take one time, one time, and you're hooked. It rewires your brain. And so it is a health crisis from the standpoint of those we love most from our communities. But for these demons from Mexico, and China, and Detroit, and Akron, not. We gotta go after them. We gotta go I after agree. them hard without apology. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. That was my five minute discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. And, and I think and I hope that you are going around and being able to talk this way to every county in the state. Because these are things that our legislator, I'm sure Heather knows a lot of what's happening, and Bill does too, but sometimes somebody from the outside talks a little bit more about it. You see it in a little perspective than the other way. And I love the Blue Lives Matter. Uh, can anybody get those? They can, absolutely. So the license plate is one of our vanity plates in West Virginia. We have this weird constitutional amendment. Like, I would like the revenues from that license plate to go back to law enforcement it's for good. equipment and safety goods and maybe even help their salaries. Yeah. Uh, but we have this weird thing in West Virginia. Like, even the West Virginia Coal Association, like, those dollars don't go to the Coal Association. We need to change that. And because in Kentucky, they're always bragging about, in Kentucky, they have more license plates for the Coal Association than West Virginia does, but we have more miners and more GDP. Even your veterans, your veterans, your even veterans could go back to the yeah. veterans. But the dollars shouldn't go to the state. We need those dollars where they're directed. If you buy that plate, I think most people would think the money goes to law enforcement or it goes to the Coal Association or veterans. Okay. So. Very good. Enjoyed it Is very there anything? Much. Yes. Thanks. Thank Sorry I went so anything? long. It's just important stuff we got to talk about. And probably we could go another hour or so. We can go, we can go a lot more hours. Is there anything else we need to bring up for our meeting? Okay, I would like to have a uh, maybe a, just a breakfast meeting here, uh, and I'll send it out for a week and get together and work on the potato festival. Uh, not, it's not going to be a big meeting. It'll just be a show up, and we can get everything together. But I'll send you a note, okay, and we'll work on that. The Potato Festival is, I was pulling it up, it's going to be the 11th, is that the 10th and 11th, is that correct? The 10th is Friday. Yeah, 10th and 11th. So we will try to get together last week somewhere in August. August the 28th is a state meeting, so I will be gone, and it will be before that. Uh, let's plan to have another meeting on September, 20th. That'll be our regular meeting. We'll have it here. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, the next day is Buzz and I was going to send a wedding anniversary. Well, this party. So we probably won't be here. You won't be here. Oh, are you going to go travel someplace? I don't know. Okay, well, we'll go ahead. If you can't be here, that's Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, Jeremy, thank you. Appreciate it. Can I have a motion that this meeting be adjourned?
I have a motion to vote. The second by Stanton. All in favor, aye. Thank you guys very, very much. Appreciate you.